what I thought I would do today is, uh, given the, uh, the, the, the wide range of audience here, uh, basically give you sort of uh, an introduction and maybe a selective survey in work um, on robust mechanism design that Stephen Morris and I have been uh, pursuing uh, for, for a number of years. And so I will probably talk for a while and then, and then just stop. Uh, um, so uh, we'll basically begin um, with sort of um, uh, with the canonical uh, the setup, the canonical setup of mechanism design, mechanism design and implementation, um, are really literatures who have uh, been very successful in the in the past few decades, and uh, both on a theoretical level, uh, but also in terms of the application that the theory um, has actually found. Uh, one common criticism in sort of in the transition from the theoretical development to the to the application is that often the, uh, the proposed solution of the theoretical models uh, seem, seem rather complex, difficult, and so uh, in the application you will often find uh, simplification um, or restrictions imposed on the nature of the optimal mechanism in order to respond to some perceived um, weaknesses or fragility of the, of the theoretical uh, mechanism. And so uh, notions which um, are basically as old as mechanism design, in fact, Horwich already um, sort of uh, proposed a non-parametric approach um, to, to mechanism designs. A work like simplicity, a work like non-parameter-free uh, or detail-free, distributional-free, um, and notions like dominant strategy and exposed equilibrium, which are meant to reflect uh, some kind of restriction on, uh, on, the, on the problem. Okay. Uh, we want to sort of uh, take perhaps a, a step back in this research and we want to say, well, um, if it's the case that uh, the, the theoretical problem seems too, too, too complex or, or too, too subtle relative to the situation, then maybe it's because our, the way we originally formulated the problem uh, didn't really incorporate the constraints uh, that we should have sought of um, right from the beginning. And so that suggests that basically uh, one could sort of think of improve or uh, augment the, the traditional canonical model of mechanism design and then maybe endogenously um, generate some of the, uh, the simple feature, the detail-free feature, the robustness features, uh, which we commonly see uh, in the applications. Okay. And uh, in, in this talk and in this approach, we uh, essentially uh, want to say that uh, we want to weaken the informational requirements, okay, and in particular we want to weaken uh, the assumption that uh, the planner um, shares a lot of common knowledge uh, with the agents. Okay, and that, that idea that one wants to weaken the informational assumption, in particular wants to weaken the assumption of shared common knowledge, um, really um, has been encapsulated in, we'll just talk in the in the foyer on it, um, and what has been called, I think Eric dubbed the, um, uh, dubbed the, the other Wilson doctrine, as it were, um, by, by Bob Wilson, which um, is sort of encapsulated really in a very nice um, quote, which I took from his presidential address, um, I guess, two decades ago. Um, and um, what, he, what he posited there, so let me read it for you, is that uh, game theory has a great advantage in explicitly analyzing the consequences of trading rules that presumably are really common knowledge. Okay? But then he goes on to, to remark that um, it is deficient to the extent that it assumes other features to be common knowledge, such as one agent's probability assessment about another's preferences or about the information that other agents have. Okay? And on the basis of that, he then really uh, proposes a, a program of research um, which says that I foresee the progress of game theory as depending on successive reductions in the base of common knowledge required to conduct useful analysis of practical problems. And it's almost an operational definition by saying that only by repeatedly weakening of common knowledge assumptions will the theory approximate reality. Okay, so, um, so that, that's basically, um, in a snapshot, the, the, the point of view that we, uh, we took in this research, and we want to say, let's weaken the informational requirements. And um, our canonical model of incomplete information, um, as proposed by Hazani and then 
uh, further formalized by Merton Samir, is really ideally suited to this operation. Because there's a sense in which uh, it's quite naturally to relax the common knowledge shared among the information uh, by simply looking at larger type spaces, that is, by endowing the individual agents with more private information, uh, and in consequence, diminishing the amount of common knowledge that is uh, in, in the system. Okay? And so there's a sense in which by looking at larger and larger type spaces where we distribute more and more of the common information into private information, we're looking at situations where we actually make fewer and fewer assumptions about the shared information of the agents. Okay? And so um, while Hazani, Merton, Samir really showed that um, there's no loss of generality to think that there's common knowledge about the type spaces, this really requires to look at large type spaces, whereas in our economic canonical models, we typically have very small type spaces. Okay? And the smallness in the type space, yet under the assumption of common knowledge, is in general problematic, but uh, as some recent papers, in particular the paper by Neiman and others have shown, it's particularly problematic in the context um, of auction theory mechanisms. Okay. So, um, as this is sort of a little bit of a survey, uh, maybe let me start it at our beginning, which was uh, around maybe 2000 when uh, we started to work on this. And the idea was to say, uh, let's try to bring the language of um, richer types, of type spaces, of higher order beliefs, into the literature on mechanism design. Um, basically, sort of first make explicit what have been the implicit assumption on common knowledge and then try to gradually weaken the common knowledge assumption and see what that does do to the nature of the mechanism um, and whether the mechanism then still can perform the required tasks. Okay? And so um, what we thought we could do was sort of uh, get a few uh, abstract results uh, and then uh, move on rather rapidly to sort of link this then to the actual applications. And um, I'm sad to, <laughs> sorry to report that we have basically um, we just completed at point one. Okay, uh, so, um, so 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 that's basically um, sort of a little bit um, of a of a survey, and I'll I think that I'll um, basically give you sort of an idea uh, what what um, what's the the motivation behind this line of research, what are some of the key results, uh, and and leave it as that. Okay. A common feature of, of this entire set of papers is that they share um, a common environment. So I will give you sort of the, the general environment first, um, but then rapidly specialize it to sort of a, a simple example and then I show you by, by means of the simple example in a single unit auction what are sort of the main implications of our results for this, uh, for this example and then um, leave the generalities for, for another. Okay, but, but just um, so that you have an idea what is sort of the general environment uh, for which we propose these results. It's a, it's a canonical model of a mechanism design where there's a finite agent. Uh, each agent um, is endowed with some private information which we refer to as payoff type because that is really the information which determines this evaluation in terms of the utility function. There's some uh, social outcome A, and the utility function will, the evaluation of a choice by society will depend on that allocation and on the payoff type profile of the other agents. So in particular, um, that allows uh, the agents to evaluate his utility not only on the basis of his own information, but also on the basis of information that other agents may have. Okay. So we were basically in a, an environment with interdependent values um, and the, the case of private values is naturally uh, embedded in that. And the, the, what the mechanism designer would, uh, would like to do um, would be basically define a mapping from the pay of relevant types uh, into some choice in the allocation. Uh, I, I call this the payoff environment which we want to keep fixed because that's really all the information that we need in order to evaluate um, a particular outcome, both from the individual point of view and from the social point of view. Okay? But in general, uh, agents may have information, may have private information 
way beyond what is encoded in the payoff types. Right? They may have information not only about their own preferences, they may have information that is beliefs about the payoff types of the other agents, they may have beliefs about the information of the other agents, they may even have higher order beliefs. All this uh, is sort of captured in the, in the canonical Bayesian model of type space. Okay? So uh, a generic type space is then denoted by TI, and that type will have in itself encoded information both about the payoff relevant type, theta i, but it will also have encoded in it um, a information about the likelihood of other agents to be of certain types. Right? And, um, with the results of Mertens and Zemir, we can sort of think about uh, as there being equivalence between these type spaces and sort of hierarchical information of types where beliefs over beliefs over beliefs. Okay? And so in, in the canonical Bayesian setting, um, a type space then is simply a collection of these types and mappings uh, which specify what kind of information is conveyed in the type or by the type or as payoff environment and also over the beliefs of the other. And we basically are interested then in, in specifying larger and larger type spaces which uh, give more and more information, make more and more information private and make less and less information common. Okay. So, so here's exactly uh, the example that I want to, uh, to basically go through with you and sort of illustrate some of the results, um, which is basically the... Um, uh, uh, just a single unit allocation. So think about this as a, a single unit auction, if you wish, where each agent has a payoff type. Let's just assume it's somewhere between zero and one. And uh, the valuation of the agent will depend on his own payoff type and possibly on the payoff type of the other agent. Okay? All agents have quasi-linear utility, so that their net utility is simply their gross utility from getting the object if they assign it minus, um, the, minus the transfer utility. Okay? This general class of interdependent value models, um, Eric defined it first in, in, in 92 and then uh, elaborated on it uh, with, uh, with us with that. Okay. But what I emphasize want to is that this, in this specification of the model, we only think about the payoff types. We do not specify at all what the beliefs of the agents are about each other uh, and in particular what the higher order beliefs are. Okay. So let me uh, be specific or give you sort of uh, I narrow it down further. Uh, in a private value model, of course, we, uh, we have the fact that my valuation depends only on my own private payoff type. Um, if we are interested in an efficient allocation, then we can run a second price yield bid auction, a victory auction, in which each agent makes a bid. And uh, I should, don't have to remind you what the rules of the second price auction is. Uh, let it suffice that there is basically an efficient allocation of the object, which simply is to give it to the person with the highest valuation. And associated with it, we can find transfers, which then also implement uh, truth-telling as a dominant strategy. Okay. Okay. We want to go beyond private values. So uh, the, the leading example for this talk of interdependent values is simply one where uh, my valuation is a linear combination of my own payoff type plus some weighted average over the information of the other ones. So you can think basically as gamma as a parameter which sort of measures the, the strengths and the interdependence of the preferences. A positive gamma expresses positive interdependence, a negative gamma expresses negative interdependence. That will be um, sort of, of, of information later on. Okay. Can we get uh, an efficient outcome in this interdependent value model? And uh, the answer to this uh, was um, first given uh, in the earlier mentioned paper, where one shows that basically a generalized sort of Vickery Groves Clark mechanism uh, indeed implements the efficient allocation. Okay? What happens here is that each uh, player sort of is making a bit or is reporting a type. And what he assessed is not the second highest valuation, but what he assessed is simply the second highest bid plus the weighted sum of the, the bits of the others, because that's sort of to reflect uh, the, the value of the interdependence. Okay? And the important thing to notice here is that uh, we get efficient implementation in the direct mechanism, okay? but the equilibrium is not going to be dominant strategy anymore. It's just going to be uh, 
an exposed equilibrium that is given that everybody else is reporting truthfully, I will also have an incentive to report truthfully, and I will be happy to report truthfully even conditional on the other agents reporting. So there's no, no averaging, no taking expectations here. This is through profile by profile. So let me just, just uh, quickly give you sort of the, the formal definition before we then can start stating the first results. Um, just for my information, absolutely, does yes. that result depend on the same having the same gamma for all the other agents, or would it work if you had different gammas? No, this is a, uh, it doesn't work for all gamma. So the, the importance, and that's the, the result in, uh, in Eric's paper, is that uh, one needs to have a bound on the interdependence in order to get incentive compatibility, and that bound is that uh, at the margin, my, an increase in my own signal has a stronger impact on my own valuation than on the valuation of the right, other but agents. But you're absolutely right. But these could I. be uh, gamma, the gamma IJs could vary across types, across matches. Uh, that would all be fine. I'm just formulating it here for the simplest case because I want to do some calculus and it's going to be easier if it's a simple gamma. But it's actually nice to know that it works for, for general one. And we'll, we'll see some results for general gammas later on. So all this is here just for simplicity. Okay? So just to emphasize um, what an exposed equilibrium is, and also to emphasize that in private values, this notion actually coincides with dominant strategies. But in interdependent values, these two notions um, are, are quite different. And in fact, um, it's unlikely that dominant strategy equilibria do exist in models with interdependent values. Okay? Formally, then, just to sort of to, to, to point out the difference between sort of a Bayesian notion, which takes into account all the information, and an equilibrium notion or an incentive compatibility notion of exposed, um, the exposed equilibrium in the direct mechanism, as it were, would simply say to say that for all possible type profile that the other agents could have, if they report truthfully, that is, if their true type and their reported type coincide, then I have an incentive to also report my type truthfully. And that's true for all type profiles. An interim uh, or a Bayesian equilibrium notion, which would simply say, well, given the expectation or given the information I have with my type, and given, therefore, the expectation that that engenders about the types of the others, I would like to tell the truth. So we're taking here then expectations with respect to our information and requiring the equilibrium only to hold in expected values rather than profile by profile. Okay, and um, I should have omitted, uh, so I should have, well, it's actually correct, it says, but a dominant strategy simply would say in this interdependent values context, just to emphasize the point, that I'm happy to tell the truth irrespective of what the other agent's telling me, in particular irrespective of whether their reports coincide with their true types. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I thought you'd set up so that the social choice function was defined on preference types. Uh, very Define good. So if we, are, if we restrict ourselves to just um, Bayesian implementation, or I call it interim because we, we don't necessarily need even a common prior in this environment here, uh, then, of course, I would have the freedom to possibly use information other than the payoff types in order to get incentive compatibility. So th then there's no reason for me to restrict myself to be just measurable with respect to the payoff types I could allow to use and extract other useful information. So you're only imposing that when you're talking about ex post. It, that's exactly right. Thank you. Okay. So, so here's the first question that, uh, that we want to ask. Okay. Uh, we want to find conditions uh, under which we can identify a mechanism with a property that this mechanism implements the social choice function, let's think simply about an efficient allocation, uh, for any beliefs and higher order beliefs that the agents may have. Okay. So not only is it a mechanism which works for a particular belief structure, but it in fact works for all possible belief structures. That's the sense in which we uh, would then like to say that this mechanism solves the incentive problem robustly because it solves it for a wide class of, uh, of beliefs. Okay. So in our single good example, um, the, the efficient correspondence is where we choose uh, the efficient assignment and then uh, find a particular uh, transfer scheme which, which implements that. Uh, 
uh, would be such a uh, desired solution. Okay. And from uh, from my from my argument, it should be um, clear that. Um, the notion of uh, exposed equilibrium and exposed incentive compatibility is indeed, uh, a can, as is indeed a sufficient condition for this robustness requirement. Okay. Um, the question is, is it also necessary? Okay. And so here, if you want to think about what happens if we sort of increase the type spaces, is that we actually give the agents more and more private information. Uh, in turn, we basically create more and more incentive constraints. So we impose more and more restrictions on what the designer can do and how he can respond to the information. As we add more and more to these incentives constraints, the problem becomes, the constraints become more severe. And the question is, in the limit, can we still satisfy these constraints? Uh, and what's the nature of the social choice function that it has to satisfy in order to satisfy this multitude of constraints? Okay. And so, we can so go from small type spaces to largest type spaces in the language of Merton Samir, the universal type space, and that gives us sort of a whole range. And so the, one of the earlier results in this literature um, was uh, precisely an equivalent statement, which is to say that um, a social choice function is exposed incentive compatible if and only if it can, it's interim incentive compatible for all possible type spaces. And, and that result can be generated, uh, can be generalized, as stated here, for social choice function to social choice correspondences with, uh, with some structure, in particular with sort of a product structure. And it's important to know that this is actually not, it's not going to be satisfied uh, for all social choice functions. So, for example, deficient allocation, which about the balance, uh, fails this, this requirement of the product structure. In fact, we can show that the equivalence result there doesn't hold. So it's, it's really, it's imposing some bite, um, but it allows us to solve for a large class of problem um, in, a, uh, in, a, in a robust way. Okay. In other words, put, we can think about the exposed equilibrium basically as an equilibrium notion which encodes or incorporates uh, robustness to higher order beliefs. Okay. If you think sort of about the issues of simplicity, uh, that's also nice because it's much easier to compute the exposed incentive compatible transfers than it is to compute transfers which uh, satisfy uh, Bayesian incentive compatibility. That is a verification. It's much easier for exposed because we don't have to take expectations. That operation is omitted. Okay. And this um, is really um, sort of a, a natural extension and generalization um, of uh, results um, established in the late 70s um, on, on private, on the, uh, on, the, on the robustness of dominant strategy or the interpretation of dominant strategy as being a robust implementation in, in private value environments. And what we do here is sort of extend that environment to interdependent values and see uh, whether we can find sort of a, a similar encoding, and it turns out that that's, that's the exposed equilibrium. Okay. So, so this first result, uh, to, to rephrase that, says that um, basically in the direct mechanism, uh, truth telling is going to be in equilibrium for all possible type spaces if it's the case that the social choice function satisfies the exposed incentive constraints for all the agents and at all the type profiles. Okay? But that simply says that we can identify one equilibrium in this uh, truthful uh, in this direct mechanism, which has the property, and it suggests another question maybe to ask whether in fact it is the only equilibrium, or whether all the equilibria lead to the efficient outcome which we want to achieve, or might there be other equilibrium lurking in this mechanism which would achieve outcomes far from what we have desired? Mm -hmm. um, in the statement of the theorem, I'm thinking about the right to left direction. So, yes. I'm wondering if you need to use every type space to get that direction, or if you really need to use. No. So, uh, so that's a it's a very nice point um, that, in fact, to get this equivalence, uh, we don't need um, to have the universal type space. Um, it is. We only need common prior type spaces, and we don't even need all common prior type spaces. 
uh, in some sense, the complete information type spaces are the critical type spaces which we need in order to, to establish this result. So that's very good. So we don't need the full strength of the universal type space in order to get this equivalent. So, very, uh, by the way, that um, sort of qualification is true for the social choice function, uh, but for social choice correspondences, actually, it turns out that you sometimes would like to use larger type spaces in order to get the equivalence. That is, for social choice correspondences, uh, it is often the case that you, uh, this equivalent statement is not going to be true just with common prior type spaces, but you need larger type spaces in order to make it Mm -hmm. is, is, the revel is there a revelation principle on each side of this equivalence that would justify, that justifies looking at truth telling? Yes. Okay. yes. Okay. So I mentioned that we, the, uh, we could now naturally pursue this and say, well, um, are there other equilibria or are there conditions under which, in fact, all equilibria in this mechanism uh, will lead us an exposed equilibrium? Okay. That is, what we could ask for is whether we have full implementation uh, under the solution concept of exposed equilibrium, and uh, we then um, follow sort of the literature by saying we refer to that as exposed implementation. That is, all equilibria uh, lead to the desired outcome, um, and and here uh, one can establish a result um, of exposed monotonicity, uh, which is familiar both from the complete information literature. Um, and to the incomplete information. That is, now of course, mass and monotonicity so the notion for complete information. Interestingly, um, even though uh, the notion of exposed has a flavor of complete information, as sort of you have suggested, the, the condition of exposed monotonicity um, is neither implied nor does it imply mass and monotonicity. Okay, in particular, um, in our example, uh, Surprisingly, the direct mechanism, namely the generalized BCG mechanism, in fact satisfies the exposed monotonicity condition uh, as long as we have interdependent values and as long as we have uh, three or more. So there, there's a strong uh, implementation condition in the, uh, even in the direct mechanism, which, um, which is, is a little bit surprising. Okay. But now we phrase the, the problem actually a little bit too narrow in some sense if we are concerned with robustness, because all we have addressed now is the fact that there do not exist non-desirable <laughs> exposed equilibria, that is, there do not exist non-desirable equilibria, which has a strong robustness property. But there might exist other base in interim equilibria, which, uh, which uh, are still uh, part of that mechanism, and which therefore uh, would sort of uh, violate the spirit of, of getting implementation in a robust sense. Okay. So we, we could, um, and we do, um, ask this question um, in a little bit stronger form um, by, by saying, uh, can we uh, find a mechanism, or what kind of properties would it have, so that uh, for any beliefs and higher order beliefs, the desired outcome is an equilibrium, and no other outcomes do form an equilibrium, and now by equilibrium, we really mean just interim equilibrium. Okay. And if we can guarantee that property, then we want to think about this as uh, satisfying or achieving robust implementation, this implementation with respect to all beliefs in high order. Does interim equilibrium just equilibrium? Sorry, I, I should have said that. Um, since the, the type spaces don't necessarily have a common prior, we don't want to refer to this base, and we simply want to say, given the interim information that the agents have, I want the, the incentive conditions satisfied. So it's a sort of a natural generalization to emphasize the point that we don't necessarily uh, require common priors here. Okay. Okay. And uh, it's sort of... Um, um, known that uh, in the private values case, a robust implementation fails because telling the truth is just a weak best response. There are many equilibria which don't lead to the efficient outcome. Okay? And so uh, robust, uh, robust implementation um, 
is not possible even if we look at a larger augmented mechanism. Uh, and so what, what we suggest here um, is to say, well, uh, can we get robust implementation for nearby, for almost efficient applications? Okay. Mm -hmm. but by strengthening the equilibrium concept a bit, you can rule out these, uh, these other equilibrium. That's so, so, so in a Vickery auction, if you uh, in, impose that, that, that strategies uh, not be weakly dominated. That's exactly uh, but I, I can't remember. Can't, have, you, have you looked at that? Um, uh, it, it, so this the operation that I'm just suggesting shortly uh, is basically so the dual operation to what you're suggesting rather than eliminating weekly, um, uh, weekly dominated strategy, we just change the mechanism a little bit that true setting becomes a strictly dominant strategy. Um, and we do that because um, for, for, the, for the analysis and especially for sort of epistemic foundations, um, it's much nicer to think about uh, a strict uh, dominance rather than, than weak dominance. Okay, so, so, so here's, in, in our little example, um, a simple modification of the mechanism which would do the job. Basically, we're staying with our um, efficient allocation with high probability, one minus epsilon, and with a very small probability, uh, we're going to give the object with a probability which is increasing in its own bit, to agent I. Okay? Um, and uh, since now the allocation and the payment depends with a small probability on my bits, we basically restore the fact that uh, truth telling or truth forbidding is a strictly dominant strategy. Okay? And so therefore, uh, in, the, uh, in the private value environment, uh, we can guarantee robust implementation, but of course at the cost of relaxing uh, efficiency to, to absolute efficiency. But that, that's what I meant by sort of you know. mm -hmm. Things are not um, quite as easy when we now go to the, to the interdependent value environment. Um, so we can um, use sort of the same idea of, of strengthening in some sense the responsiveness of the allocation uh, to, to the report or to the bit so that a true standing becomes now a strict exposed equilibrium and removes the weakness in our original regions. Okay? But that alone turns out is not sufficient to guarantee exposed implement uh, to guarantee robust implementation. Okay? And sort of the, the 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 remaining time I want to sort of um, convince you uh, and give you sort of the uh, series of arguments um, to show you that when we think about robust implementation in interdependent value environments, uh, there's a new condition occurring which relates to the strengths in the interdependence of preference and the independence of information in the, in the environment. And the result that I will uh, arrive at uh, at the end is to say that in the interdependent value environment, uh, we can achieve robust implementation. We can achieve robust implementation, uh, but at the cost of restricting our environment to allow for only weak interdependence. That is, the parameter of interdependence, which early on had to be just bounded by one in order to get incentive compatibility, now needs to be bounded by one over the number of agents in the symmetric environment. There's a more general condition uh, for, 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 for non-symmetric preferences. Uh, in order uh, to get to get a robust implementation, okay. and uh, an interesting uh, side aspect is that if we get uh, if this condition is satisfied, then we can get robust implementation in the direct mechanism. On the other hand, if it fails, then we can get no robust implementation, neither in the direct nor any augmented mechanism. Okay. And uh, in fact, um, your comment earlier on on using weak versus strict. Um, it's paralleled in, a, in an earlier paper by uh, Chung and Evie where they look at the, at the single unit auction and use weak el uh, elimination of weakly dominated strategy and basically obtain the same results um, uh, for sufficiency, uh, but then because of using the weak, uh, um, weak elimination, they can't get uh, necessary conditions which we can take. So that's one um, additional. So, so that's sort of the, the last result I want, I want to report and give you a little bit of a flavor 
uh, of, uh, of what is going on. Uh, what we're going to do um, here is now, uh, from in terms of the argument, quite a bit different from the uh, from the truthful implementation, because we're going to use an epistemic result. Um, which has long been established in the complete information literature, which now makes its way into the incomplete information literature. And it goes as follows. Um, we want to establish a relationship between uh, an equilibrium on any type space, on a arbitrary type space, and the class of actions uh, which we want to call uh, rationalizable actions. So in the complete information literature, uh, there's an epistemic result which says basically that there exists an equilibrium in some type space, that is for some information, <coughs> even only if these strategies are part of the rationalizable actions. And that result um, is also true in a world of incomplete information. And what this allows us is rather than looking at all possible equilibria on larger and larger type spaces, or even universal type spaces, we can rephrase this question in terms of an iterative procedure, uh, namely rationalizability for incomplete information, in which we don't have to refer at all to the large type spaces, but an iterative procedure which is simply defined on the smaller type spaces, just on the pair of type spaces. And it's this iterative procedure and sort of a contraction property which uh, then leads us to, in the specific example, to the result that gamma has to be smaller than one over the number of agents minus one. So, so what's the key uh, epistemic result? That is to say, if you think about general mechanism, um, that a mechanism or a message mi can be sent for an agent with a pair of type theta i in some interim equilibrium on some type space, if and only if we can show and establish that this message is rationalizable, that is, can be a best response to some conjecture by agent i about the messages of the other agents. Okay. And this notion of rationalizability is basically um, uh, the solution concept is implemented by a recursive procedure where we'll first start off by saying, well, uh, we can't impose any restriction on what an agent could do. And then we slowly eliminate possibility this is possible messages that an agent could do given that those messages can't be a best response for any possible beliefs that he entertains about the other agents. And by recursively animating more and more of these messages, we might eventually come down to a, a fairly good descriptions of what are rationalizable in the sense of best responses to some conjectures. Okay. So in, in the general life BCG mechanism, the direct mechanism, a message is simply a report that an agent makes, truthful or not. And a conjecture is then simply a probability distribution over the reports that the other agents may make, uh, as a or not as a function, and the types they are going to be. Okay. And we could simply say, in this iterative process, in round k, let's call beta i of k those messages of agent i with type theta i, with a particular pair of type, that are rationalizable in the sense that there exists some conjecture that agent I has about the other's opponent's types as well as reports, okay? Given that these reports were subject to the restriction that these reports are still uh, conceivable, that is, at least have not been eliminated in the process before, and then iterate this procedure, okay? One of the reasons that I, I chose to, to work with the Zinnia model here for this talk is that in the linear model, this procedure is, uh, is really quite accessible, and we can sort of do the calculations um, as, as we go. With linear interdependence, as it were, the exposed incentive compatible transfer is quadratic, and therefore the best response of an agent to point beliefs is simply linear best response. Okay? So that if agent um, is of type theta i, and he believes that the other agents have a type profile theta j, but report something possibly different, namely theta j prime, then his best response is simply to report his truthful, his true type, plus um, a weighted sum where this sum reflects the differences uh, between the reported type and the true type. So in some sense, he's trying to offset uh, the misreport 
that he believes the other agents are going uh, to be. And of course, the immediate verification is that um, truth telling that is the agreement of report and type uh, is indeed uh, an equilibrium because the satisfied BBB uh, best response. Okay. But due to the linear structure, we can now basically characterize a set of best responses in terms of a lower bound or an upper bound and iterate this process to basically see whether these bounds converge and what are the conditions so that these bounds converge. Okay. And so let me just remind you, this is the linear best response. Okay. In any particular round, <coughs> what is sort of the largest possible report that I could make while I'm type theta i? Well, I can't go more than, than one. That was our uh, a priori bound on, on the types. Okay. What's the largest type I could choose? Well, let's just suppose that gamma is positive for the moment. Then that's uh, that report which is sustained by beliefs of agent I about the remaining agent which make this difference as large as possible. Mm -hmm. But of course, what are those types? Well, these are the types which basically have assumed the lowest possible reports being submitted by the other agents. So we basically determine the upper bound of H and I in terms of the lower bound of all the other agents in the previous round. Okay. In this linear environment, this is really just an iteration on this operator gamma times I minus 1 because initially the maximum difference between type and report is 1. They are I minus 1 agents and the weight they are giving them is simply gamma. Okay. So then we basically iterate in each round and raise this difference to the power of k, and therefore the question then resolves simply, is it going to be the case that eventually I will just be left always reporting truthfully? Well, that's the case if and only if this expression converges to zero as k goes to infinity, which is basically to say the weight gamma has to be strictly smaller than one over ions. Okay. Okay. And so, so that's, uh, that gives you sort of... Um, the, the sufficiency, and in this example, it's easy to convince ourselves that it's also necessary because let's just take a particular belief that agent I has over the types of the other agents, okay, which uh, depends on his own type. So it's exactly calibrated in some sense, such that actually his expected value of the object is independent of his own type. That is, his belief of the other two agents very sufficiently so that in expectation his expected value of the object does not depend on his <coughs> own type. And since that's the case, now it's going to be impossible to separate two types through incentive constraints and through rewards because all of these types have the same belief about what the value of the object is. So, so that basically shows you that this is uh, both a necessary and sufficient result um, and... Um, uh, and it's basically determined by, by, by the strengths of the interdependence. Okay. Let me just perhaps sort of to do give you the idea uh, how this condition looks in the, on the general environment um, to, to sort of convince you at least hint that uh, the specifics of the model don't matter here. So let's simply uh, think about the generalization of this model where uh, we basically have a compact type space for each of the agents. And where the preference that agents has um, are going to be determined to an aggregate of uh, the payoff types of all the other agents. Okay. And in order to get again, incentive compatibility, you want to assume that the preference are single crossing in this aggregate. Okay. So clearly, um, the linear model I just proposed to you, proposed to you has this aggregation property, but uh, a very specific one. Okay. Then the general result is that robust implementation is possible in a direct mechanism if and only if we have strict exposed incentive compatibility and this contraction property is satisfied. Okay. That uh, I mentioned early on. And what is this contraction property? It's basically a statement which is to say that uh, the my own preferences or my own information that is the difference between theta i and the valuation of the object with another reported type, those changes 
induced through my own type are large enough to offset any other changes that could uh, be introduced into my preferences through variation in the type of the other agents. That is, I can always uh, find the same sign in terms of the variation of preferences induced simply through changing my own type and uh, changing uh, all of the other agents. And then this condition in the linear model is just equivalent to this bound. And if you um, think now sort of a generalized linear model, which you had uh, presumably in mind, right? yeah. where uh, now my value or my aggregate is simply a weighted aggregate, which can depend both on my own type as well as the type of the other agents, uh, then we can think about gamma, uh, which is simply the entries of the interaction terms as basically sort of the interaction matrix, the interdependence matrix, okay? Removing the, the off diagonal, which basically says, well, how strong are these interdependences? And then and taking the absolute values, okay? Uh, then uh, here sort of one can use a, uh, as an, a, a classic linear algebra uh, result or reduce it eventually to a classic linear algebra result, which says that the contraction property is satisfied even only if the eigenvalue of this interaction matrix, so the modulo of the interaction matrix, has an eigenvalue. The largest has an eigenvalue smaller than that. And that basically guarantees that this contraction property proceeds and eliminates more and more messages until it singles down on and choose to just be the, the, the only time. Okay. So, um, I don't think I have, I have time for that. Um, let me perhaps just sort of give you an outlook, given that we um, sort of proceeded slowly the first uh, time around. Um, it, it, you know, especially if you're coming sort of uh, from, uh, from, from, from a use to other notions of robustness, what will strike you here is that when we speak about type spaces, we sort of require large robustness in the sense that we are allowed for all possible beliefs and higher order beliefs. And so it's natural to think um, about sort of more local or intermediate notions of robustness or restrictions on the type space that maybe a common prior or a common prior over the pair of types is satisfied to, to, to get um, a little bit more heavy. We also focus very much on efficient allocation problem, and it's still an open question whether and how one would go about proving sort of robust predictions for revenue maximization problems, which inherently uh, will have to uh, be phrased with respect to the beliefs that the agents have. Um, the other sort of uh, minor issues, which is to say, well, it can be sort of restate single crossing conditions in rich type space in an interesting way, which sort of reflect the interdependence. Um, and I think our interest is more sort of using the insights we got from mechanism design, which we really were quite helpful in terms of designing uh, exactly the mechanism so that we get strong robustness results, strong positive results, uh, more generally in games with private information, where typically we won't get such strong predictions, robust predictions, in terms of just points. Um, but we could ask whether we can get sort of set predictions, partial predictions, uh, in terms of what is the distribution of outcomes uh, in a class of games if we allow a set of possible things. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we actually do have time for a couple of questions. So I assume you'll just handle them yourself. Yes, they are. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so what are some sufficient conditions for that contraction property? Uh, are there any uh, some strategic complements or so? Ah, yes. So um, actually, no. Um, I wanted to go back, maybe just to to pray um, to see what I can find it on the. Sum of the weights is less than one sufficient. So, so notice that the actually the condition we had was a necessary and sufficient condition. Uh, but it was formulated in terms of uh, not the, the value, but the absolute value of the, um, of, the, uh, of the interaction. So for the contraction property, actually, uh, complementarity substitution doesn't uh, play an important role at all. 
So whether they're all positive or all negative, that doesn't play the role. What is needed is the case that the radius, the radius of the interaction is bounded. And for that, all that matters is the, the absolute value rather than the sign or the direction of the uh, result. But that's, uh, so th th that was one of the, of the last results uh, which I could have taught. Uh, that is only true if we look at the notion of rationalizability and in particular don't impose any common prior assumptions. When we impose common prior assumptions, so that's a natural question to say, let's at least assume possibly over a large type space that the agents share common prior, then the sign of the interaction matrix actually makes a big difference. It is then the results are going to look quite different for uh, environments where we have strategic complements as opposed to environments where we have strategic substitutes. So that's part of our thinking is that it might be interesting to look at these intermediate cases because we want to know how important is the common prior for predictions uh, and can we really get, mi when is it that we can get mileage or impose restrictions by assuming that the agent at least have a common prior in terms of sharing information. But for the notion of rationalizability, uh, the sign didn't matter at all. Was that your question? I thought the question was, what's the sufficient condition that the contraction property for the matrix holds, right? Yeah. And the sufficient condition was that the largest eigenvalue... Right, right, but she said, what was the sufficient condition? For, for example, if the row sums are all less than one, that would be a sufficient condition, right? Yeah, so then, they're right, so they're, they're weaker sufficient condition in some sense, uh, which are sort of, it's a classic literature on, in linear algebra on... Uh, do, uh, diagonal dominance and Gersh 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 theory. Hmm? Gersh yeah. Gersh theory. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, so I think there's a large class of. Uh, um, mm -hmm. of, of you get the same sort of thing out of Roth too. I mean, it's, just, um, it's just a stability condition of a different support. Yeah, but Roth Herberts is pretty hard to apply to I agree. a large it's not easy to But Gersh Gersh theorem yeah. is pretty easy to yeah. No, but I was trying to, so I think, uh, I, I was curious about sort of if you can say something about uh, the interactions, something that will uh, guarantee. Uh, well, that's why I said, I think if the row sums are all, for example, or, or the column sums are all less than one. Um, that would be sufficient. Yeah. That, that would be sufficient. And that's an easy yeah. condition. I was just wondering whether Perron Frobenius theory helps. Yeah, and, sorry, oh, I was looking for this. is actually what we used. Yeah. We used the the, the yeah. proof uses Perron Frobenius theory. Mm -hmm. Well, then you're going to make sure that the dimension is high enough. Not that you, I mean? you need the dimension high enough, not larger than 2 by 2, because you're not going to have your uh, 3 by 3 will work, but not larger will work. No, so the, it's just going to be, just, uh, think, uh, the dimension doesn't matter at all, it's just that the, the conditions are going to be different. Remember that the condition was that the gamma, the interaction, is smaller than i minus 1. So, uh, exactly. So, in the, so it's interesting that in the case then of just two agents, it reduces exactly to the conditional incentive compatibility, single crossing, right? Yeah. But as soon as we have more than two agents, what we find in some sense is that we need a, 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 a qualitative restriction which is coming from the implementation characterization rather than from the from the true sign characterization. Do you, do you have any trouble with the Perron Frobenius theory if a lot of those off diagonal terms are zeros or um, or I don't remember if you assumed that they weren't zeros. No, no, they can be zeros. I mean, they're just um, no, they're sort of, then the matrix will not be necessarily irreducible. <coughs> See, it's the irreducibility condition that you need for the Perron Frobenius theorem. And, uh, and that's why I asked that's why the two relation two between the agents to But to when you get to higher dimensions, if you had zeros in there, you're going to run into some difficulties. You, have to, mm -hmm. you might need another condition. You know this better than the, the the statement, which is true irrespective of the matrix, is the eigenvalue needs to be less than one, and then yeah. sure. uh, for certain exactly, the then, and then sure for, then the, you can sort of uh, right. think further what are sort of sufficient conditions for particular classes. Well, it seems like the zeros ought to make things. Easier. Absolutely. So yeah, that makes sense. Easier because you can't use the Perron for genius. That's all. That's fine. Right. Uh, but maybe you can break it up into sub matrices and just sub irreducible and, and, and apply it to each one of those. Absolutely. So, for example, if you have local, so that's a very so we have an example. So if you have localized interaction, then of course um, you you get sort of the conditions on the local interactions rather than on, on the global. Interactions. Because if it's reducible, then then the maximum eigenvalue will be the maximum eigenvalue of the. Sub matrices. Just look at the different component parts. Yeah. So it's probably 